Hello everyone, I'm Ming Chow. Welcome to this stream. Uh, it's 4.30 Eastern Time. Um, thank you for joining. Um, for those of you who are in the graduate orientation at Tufts University Department of Computer Science, I want to extend my heartfelt and grateful, um, very enthusiastic welcome to Tufts University. Um, so this stream is live on both Twitch and on both YouTube uh, live. And what I have is I have uh, a monitor in front of me. So I'll be monitoring uh, any questions that you have. Um, I actually see I have a couple friends and former student on as well. Uh, so I'll be answering any questions. It's impromptu. So the real point of today is twofold. One, I want to test out my setup for real time uh, for the big deal next week um, when I'm going to be opening up my security course uh, to the world on Thursdays. Um, and just want to check the setup with the green screen, lighting, audio quality, uh, camera quality, um, and uh, my desk setup. Uh, you know, one thing that I've certainly learned uh, over, you know, over the years is, you know, people usually have uh, multiple monitors and how valuable that is. Uh, for years, I've been using just one monitor, and now I've got three things going on. One for OBS, uh, one on my desktop, uh, one to monitor at both Twitch and on, um, and on YouTube. So, yeah. For any questions and thoughts, please just uh, ask away uh, on the chat on uh, YouTube and on Twitch. So, uh, born to be wrong, uh, welcome, hello, hello, thank you, thank you. Uh, Backcracker, hello, hello. Uh, Backcracker asked, uh, said, uh, just be careful. Uh, just be careful, Ming, if you say past broadcast with music, Twitch will flag it and either make you remove it or give you a warning. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, definitely appreciate that. Uh, one of the things I definitely did beforehand was um, I uh, got permission from my friend Yurk, who I work closely with in the summertime, uh, and other members of actually the Packet Hacking Village disco team, uh, DJ team, if you know, I can use uh, music and stream, and they said yes. Um, with that being, also that being said, I want to give a big shout out and thank you to Yurik for uh, allowing me to use his, uh, uh, to his, uh, for his music on here. Thank you wherever you are. Thank you. Okay. Hey, Brian. How are you? Okay. Uh, honestly, I have not used uh, Twitch much. I'll tell a good story about that a little bit later. Um, you know, about emotes. I haven't used too much emotes on, on, on Twitch. Um, EDEO5000, uh, thank you for streaming this. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, you know, with everyone going on online education these days, um, might as well make the most of it. You know, I think online, doing teaching, our education online um, has its huge, huge benefits, huge values. One of them I can tell you is um, I've been so accustomed to teaching classes over 100 over the years. Uh, like these are large classes. And I can tell you that students, um, there's always students that feel uncomfortable asking questions uh, in the class, you know, because of anxiety, you know, fear that's, you know, it's a stupid question. Here, uh, the electronic medium, number one, I, I mean, on most cases, I can't uh, tell if a, if a student's real name um, by the handle, so I can't do that. Um, plus, also, it's uh, against FERPA regulations that I, you know, I, that I shouldn't be announcing. I can't announce people's names. So this medium is great. Uh, so I can just read off the chat. Um, yeah, it's, uh, I have two monitors. 
what are these characters in the background? So, uh, the, these characters in the background, this whole scene, uh, I'm using OBS. I'm using Open Broadcast, uh, I think it's Open Broadcast, I think what the S stands for. I'm going to look it up. Hold on for a second. We call it OBS. Open Broadcaster software. I mean, it's commonly used by, um, really commonly used by streamers. Uh, and we used that for DEF CON uh, this past summer, actually last month. And so, um, because DEF CON was virtual this year and um, not in person, um, we had to do the conference, you know, online. So we used Discord, Twitch, uh, YouTube, Periscope. What else do we use? It was, oh, Facebook. Uh, we used Facebook. And so we put all the branding and stuff there. Um, so, as you can see on uh, my scene, um, I have DEF CON, well, logo, the back of the Hacking Village, my contact information. I mean, I love this scene. I love the design so much. I just said, you know what? I'm just going to use this permanently. Okay. Um, nothing on YouTube yet. So... How was a virtual DEF CON versus normal in-person setting? I will say a number of things. It went well. DEF CON virtual, now this is my personal opinion. Um, it went well. Uh, it went really well. There were some things that were really good. Some things, eh, probably better in person. The things that went really well, um, Discord, uh, the communication there, uh, the other thing off the top of my head that went really well, the accessibility. I mean, for years, I mean, you always, every year there's always people from other countries that say, I can't afford a trip to go to, uh, to go to Las Vegas in, in the summer. I can't do it. Uh, it's too expensive. Uh, and for those who always want to attend DEF CON, they had a chance to, to attend and be a part of all the events. Uh, a number of attendees, first-time attendees said, you know, it was really good. People were accessible. Even the, uh, you know, team like village, uh, village leads, um, they were very accessible. Um, that went, so that went really well. Um, the other thing I think that went well, I feel that went well, you know, we, all the content was there. Um, most talks were made available within 24 hours online. It's not like you had to wait until, back in the day, you had to wait until October for someone to post it on YouTube uh, and also the presentation slide. Now this year, almost instantaneously. You know, what cup off the top of my head, which I feel like, you know, could have been better or it worked much better in person, the Q&A uh, for talks. You know, to have that Q&A engagement with, uh, you know, have that intimate uh, talk with the, with the speaker after talk, that was hard. That was hard to do. Um, one thing that we did at DEF, uh, and a lot of villages did, a lot of places did, was to do pre-recorded videos. And the pre-recorded videos looked awesome. I mean, they were good, but therein lies the problem. They were almost too good. Uh, and so people were like, these videos look really polished, they look really clean, but people look, you know, it almost felt like you're watching a movie and it didn't feel like a real speaker live. I mean, it was almost too good. It was, it, it was almost too good, too polished, uh, and too stiff. So those were the pros and cons. Would I do it again? Would we do something like that? Would we do a virtual conference again? Yeah, I mean, we would. But it was a lot of work, too. I mean, it's a lot of work to create a conference uh, and uh, an event one, two, three, three, four days online. It's a lot of work. I think in the future, hopefully it may be shortened by it, like, cut up, like, we may not even need all three days or four days. Much better to do four, but I feel like it takes double the work. 
to do a virtual conference. Um, it was also really nice. Um, you know, we work, we still work with the people that we've known for decades. Um, it's hard to not see them in person, but still to have that continuity and still getting to see and view the people is really good. Um, here's the question. What chat are people using? I'm on Twitch. I use both. Uh, we're going to use both. I'm going to flip between, I'm going to flip between, uh, between YouTube and Twitch. Primarily Twitch because it's nice. I see nothing on YouTube so far. And hopefully that answers a, a, a Wardley's question. Uh, what's the difference between uh, encoding and encryption? And encryption. Well, uh, if this is almost like an interview question, well, encoding is going from one format to the other. So a good example is uh, if you have binary data and spitting that out onto a screen can be pretty dangerous. Um, so if you want to translate binary data into ASCII text, uh, that's encoding. Encryption is actually making information such as a plain text, such as a message, you know, in gobbledygook so it doesn't get compromised, it doesn't get stolen, and so if it even does, it's going to be hard to read. So that's in lay terms what the difference between uh, encoding and encryption is. Uh, what is EA's biggest issue? EA meaning electronic arts. Oh, um, well... Well, I can say I play FIFA. I play FIFA for years. I don't get me wrong, I love the game, but it's gone to a point where it's now just hey, play to win. It's play to win. Um, still, this is a rant. There's a lot of is it cheating? Yeah. Um, are the online rules interesting? Uh, yeah. So apparently, if someone rage quit. A game, people leave. Uh, people like we both lose. What's up with that? Um, it's also gotten to a point where it just feels like the same old, same old game every year. Same old, same old game every year. I can't speak about the culture at EA. I've never worked there, but all I do know is that internally, it's it's interesting. Okay. All right, nothing on you. Nothing on YouTube. Uh, thanks, Backcracker. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I've been seeing reviews for Madden, and uh, that's it. Yeah, I I hear it's uh, uh, interesting. Hold on, I'm gonna. I'm actually gonna. I'm actually up. I got a call. I actually got a call. Uh, when the heck I know who this is, I'm gonna drop a message. I'm going to write something. I'm actually on my keyboard right now. I'm screaming until 6 p.m. standard time. Okay. All right. That's one thing. Well, this is good to test out. I think this is this is a this is definitely good for me because you know it's been a long time since I've actually done any sort of talking, any sort of lecturing. So for me, this is a you know to work out a lot of the kinks out of the system, and also which is nice. So I know that uh, you know be careful of things like phone calls and stuff. Uh, well, so what is S A A S from Born to Be Wrong? Isn't that software as a service? Um. Software as a service. I mean, one of the things that come to mind, you know, when we talk about software as a service, is going to be things like a platform like Heroku. Uh, wait a minute. Are you asking me to? Uh, are you trying to quiz me on on what this is? I mean. I'm also hearing things like subscriptions and stuff. Ugh. I mean, I don't know if that I don't know if that question had to do anything with Backcracker's question on on EA. I don't know. Wow, no one on YouTube so far. It's only this is interesting. So one of the nice things about having a Chromebook, I'm using a Chromebook as my as my second monitor, and you know. You can flip the you can flip the screen upside down, so it acts like a tablet, and you can see everything on YouTube Studio. 
Oh, that was Brick's question? Can cybersecurity be a differentiator for a software as a service company or simple there to comply with laws? Can cybersecurity be a differentiator for a software as a service company? Well, let me just take a look. I mean, here. Well, let me ask this question. Is Heroku a software as a service company? Well, it's also a platform as a service company. Um, what was it? Right. Well, you missed my question. Which one? The, uh, the Can cybersecurity be a differentiator for a software security company? Uh, for a software as a service company? Or is simply there to comply with laws? A. Wardley about Heroku. Um, I can, let me answer that question first, because that actually may tie in with, with what Brian asked. Um, Heroku is a platform where, well, it's called, I think it's more properly known as a platform as a service that uh, enables developers to just concentrate on the, on building apps. So, before that, how things work, before things like Heroku, you had to set up your own server. You had to install all the systems. You had to install all the, all the software. You have to, um, you even had to remote connect into the server to deploy your application. You had to do everything. It wasn't just uploading an app case and bye. Uh, you had to maintain everything. Um, the full stack, servers, databases, uh, you name it. Administration was a complete, it was in, you had to do everything. You had to do administration as well. With a thing like, with a platform like Heroku, what you just do is, all you care about is just building a web app, like building an app, or like a web app. Uh, you, pro, you do your programming, uh, you, you, you build it, um, you write your configuration file, and then you just push it up to, you just push it up to somewhere. I mean, the cloud is just someone else's computer, and that's it. You don't have to worry about a lot of administration stuff. All that is taken care from you. All of that is taken care from you. The biggest issue is you have less control. You have less control of the server. You have less control of the uh, like system. The only thing that you care now is just building your application. All the administ a lot of the administration stuff goes out. You can't SSH in. So, which has a lot of pros and cons. If all you want to do is just build an app, send it up to the cloud, get a URL, have someone to use it, use something like a platform like Heroku. But at a cost of having having that control. You get your log, you get logging, um, you actually pay extra for modules that you need. Okay, yep. Um, Azure has it. By the way, one thing that I've always told people, and they really didn't know this, is that, um, the, you know, how Heroku works under the hood is AWS. Underneath the hood of uh, Heroku is just AWS, which can be really a good thing. And, Hero I mean, AWS is a monstrosity. It's all, they give you so much. It gives you a lot of stuff. It's really overwhelming. Uh, for 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 anyone that's trying to learn the entire infrastructure. So you use a place like Heroku, you don't have to deal with oh my god, what I need to use. I don't do I don't look at uh, do I have to use S3? Do I have to use um, um, CloudFront? Do I use EC2? That goes away when you use a plat when you use a platform uh, as a service like Heroku. But now I want to go back to Brian's question. Can cybersecurity be a differentiator for a cyber, for a software as a service company or simply as uh, they to comply with laws? Um, well, I mean, definitely the compliance is a huge piece of it. Um, one thing I want to look up. The nice thing is, the nice thing about this format is I can still use my desktop to look at stuff. Um, Ah, uh, software to service, Google Apps, here's some examples, Dropbox, Salesforce, Cisco, go to meeting. So one of the things where 
wait a minute. Cybersecurity, we get a differentiator. Yeah, I mean, if you're uploading, and this happens all the time. Actually, I had a, I had an issue with this a couple nights ago when I was uploading really what was for a lab exercise, and it was like, oh, by the way, you uploaded sensitive information. You uploaded, like, uh, hash, uh, username and password. I mean, those stuff can be really good. So, yeah, so to answer Brian's question is, yes, security can definitely be a differentiator, not just for like, compliance purposes, um, not just to comply with laws, but how many people have ever used, have ever uploaded secrets that you're not supposed to, uh, sometimes even accidentally, to uh, a software as a system environment. Okay, uh, would you have concerns around intellectual... Would you have concerns around intellectual property security if a company decide to have a development team overseas? I've done this before. Uh, it's always a big concern. It's always a big concern because some other countries just don't... I'm going to say... Intellectual property, what's that? I mean, you always need to look out for that. And especially when you actually have intellectual property or you're allowing other companies uh, and teams overseas to, well, review your intellectual property. If I remember correctly what my old startup did... Um, and we used the Ukraine as uh, uh, for development, and they were great. They were great. But I remember before we hired them, there was a lot of, there were contract writers, there was auditing that was done um, to make sure that, oh, uh, intellectual property doesn't get stolen or lost, like, anywhere. I don't know the, all the details. Actually, I, even can't even I can't even provide those details here, but yeah. Um, you know, if I'm not mistaken, there's some companies that, yeah, if you're worried about the intellectual property uh, of things, then you, you know, you don't give out everything. You only have to say, okay, build this piece, build this piece, build this piece, and then send it back. And it's like, oh, we just construct everything ourselves. Maybe for, ah, here it is. Here's a question. Maybe a question for later. But looking forward to hearing your thoughts, for the 116 course, which is my security class, for the Linux install, if I have an extra laptop, do you recommend installing in place of, a, just, a, uh, of just a VM? Here's my answer. My answer is if you have an extra laptop, if you have you know, an extra computer sparing around, that is not a Chromebook. That is not a Chromebook. I would absolutely recommend um, installing Kali Linux um, on uh, that extra laptop, not just a VM. And here's why. Here's why. There's a couple of things, and I've had this problem for years. Number one, a virtual machine is always slower than native. Always slower. Okay? Uh, that, that right there. Okay? Number two, when you work with virtual machines, things like the graphics and network stack is always virtualized always virtualized. Uh, you won't be actually using uh, the direct, you won't have a direct shot to the actual hardware. If you're going to do things like sniffing or password cracking, that becomes really important. When you do things like password cracking, not recommended that you use a VM because you want direct access to things like the memory and especially things like graphics cards. More perform better performance, always use native and not a VM. Um, for not only performance purposes, but also direct access to things like the hardware. Does that answer your question? 
I got water. The other thing is, I've actually gone back and here's a tumbler. Does that answer your question, A. Wardley? If you got the, if you got hardware, real hardware, spare hardware that you have, always, always nice. And also, there's another extra bonus for you, um, especially if you aren't familiar. I mean, this is just for the general audience. Even if for the general audience is for anyone who's watching, if you have that spare hardware, um, it's always. A real nice deal to use it and perhaps build like a home lab. I guess more computers the better, really. Um, so this is a real good opportunity for any learners or anyone that's new to this field to, um, you know, build like a home lab of some sort. Real good at you have direct access to hardware. You have uh, much better than VM. Much better. Anyone on YouTube? No, no one on YouTube so far. Surprising. All right, what other questions? What other question? I'm waiting. Kind of interesting. So one thing I have, I am noticing, uh, there is at least like a minute or two lag, uh, a delay between my actual stream and what goes on. Um, YouTube and uh, Twitch. I have missed this. Would a Chromebook be okay for Cali? Um, I have one. Back a few years ago, I think it was using Crout, uh, Crouton or something. You could install any Linux distribution that you want on a Chromebook. You can use anything, uh, any, anything. Um, and like Ubuntu, you can install Ubuntu, you can install Kali, you name it on a Chromebook. Things have changed a little bit recently. I've changed a little bit recently. If you have a Chromebook. I don't think you need Kali. I, I don't think you need Kali. And, and here's the reason why. Under the hood, Chromebook is Linux. And so during the regular season, like when I am teaching in the classroom, so for EDO 5000, um, when I am teaching in the classroom, my primary laptop now that I use is a is a Chromebook. Like I use a Chromebook, and I enable uh, Linux on there, so I can install all the tools that I need. And it's like really like just a handful of tools on Kali that I really really need on a day to day basis on the Chromebook. So the answer to your question is really. Um, if you have a Chromebook, all you need to do is enable, like if you have a modern Chromebook, all you need to do is just to enable Linux on your Chromebook. Um, it's going to be Debian. It's going to be Debian, which is great because Kali is based off of Debian anyway. And then you can install your tools like Wireshark, Git, um, what else? Visual Studio Code, Docker, uh, Nikto, Metasploit, you name it. You can install all the tools as that, that, that are on Kali, that, that most of the tools, if not all, that are on Kali on a Chromebook. And I've had great luck doing this. Uh, I've taught on my Chromebook for, uh, on security for, oh, I think over a year now. Okay. Um, so I hope that answers your question, ED. E O O five thousand. Yeah, I mean it's. I don't think you need definitely. Oh, the one thing that you can't use, and this is this is a pain. This is a real pain. Uh, if you're trying to run a, a virtual machine on a Chromebook, you can't do it because here's why: uh, the Linux. If you enable Linux 
on a Chromebook, what ends up being created is, well, a real glorified, it's, it's essentially a virtual machine. It's essentially a virtual machine when you actually enable Linux on a Chromebook. Um, so you doesn't you can't run a virtual machine on top of a virtual machine. No, 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 don't do that. So I hope that helps. So Chromebooks are great, um, especially now with the Linux support and the Debian support. What days uh, will you be streaming going forward? Now that's from Brian's question. Thursdays, four thirty Eastern time. Four thirty Eastern time, uh, PM. Uh, all the videos, including this one, are going to be recorded, um, so you can review it, uh, you can look back at it. Uh, and this is especially helpful, you know, there's a lot of concerns about video recording, lectures, and any education stuff, but I can tell, tell you this, and we all have done this, um, it's so helpful to have the video and that you can just always look back at like. Oh, I missed this part. Oh, I missed this part. Oh, I have a question on this part. Even help. I mean, how many of us actually have watched uh, people playing video games or tips on on YouTube and you want to fast forward to, like, the most important section? And if you actually miss something, you just go back to it. So, again, uh, live streaming going forward, Thursdays, 4.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, and all videos are going to be recorded on both Twitch and on both uh, YouTube. I don't know how long the storage will be. Uh, I do know, that's actually, thanks for bringing this up. I will need to go and download each and every video that I make so I can upload it to Canvas, uh, and for record keeping purposes as well. Okay. Uh, born to be wrong. How's your home office set up? Uh, both streaming lecture or general work. I like my, my office. So, when I, one of the things I'm very grateful for is to have a good setup. Um, I made a few moves before the pandemic that really helped big time. Um, starting, I remember in 2015, get a big monitor. 2017, get a good keyboard. Um, and then it was in 2019, uh, and I guess this was a blessing in disguise. I had a problem with a MacBook Pro. I had a problem with a MacBook Pro, and that the anti-glare film was peeling off of the MacBook Pro. It was peeling off, and I looked, and I could get that repaired for free at Apple. I just have to send it back. But then it occurred to me, maybe this is a good time to reconsider my reconsider my setup. Because especially during the summertime, and I teach online in the summer as well, I'm usually sitting at my desk at home. That's, that's, that, that's it. I mean, I'm usually sitting at my desk at home. Working. Uh, and then I also have concerns about things like battery life. And you know that laptop battery isn't going to last forever. Sometimes it gets really flaky. So I, what I ended up doing was I traded in my MacBook Pro for, for a desktop. Uh, and sure enough, little did I know how great of a move that was. Uh, so I got a mini, mini PC uh, at home. Also, sure enough, a month after I did a trade in for my Mac, uh, of my MacBook Pro, uh, there was a recall for the battery. It's like, oh, one thing after another, thank God I don't have to deal with that anymore. So I, it was a really good move that I made. And I uh, also, for teaching purposes, again, I just got a Chromebook. And recently I thought, you know, within a few months ago, it's like, you know, I do I really need the Chromebook now? Because I don't know when we're going to go back to the classroom. And um, sure enough, as I am realizing now, how valuable it is to have a uh, another screen, another laptop that I can use to monitor things like chat. Um, the setup, so my setup is good. I also want to give a huge shout out to my friend Riverside, who actually gifted me a green screen, which I am using. That's critical. 
Um, I was also really lucky that I made another great move. It was right before the pandemic, and the, it was March 3rd at probably like 2 in the morning. <laughs> 2 in the morning. I uh, went to Best Buy and I uh, online and I purchased a webcam and a mic. Um, you know, thinking, you know, this online education thing I'm going to be doing from now on. It's now time to invest in a great webcam and uh, a mic. Uh, sure enough, that turned out to be a great move because now you can't buy, it's like impossible to find a webcam anywhere, let alone a Nintendo Switch. So yeah, I, uh, my home setup is, is good. Um, I have a small desk. I'm comfortable with it. I'm trying to, the only thing I'm trying to get used to at this moment are two things. You know, I have one, two, three screens going on right now and also uh, extra lighting. I'm putting in extra, I, I just put in some extra lighting, uh, LED lighting uh, for this. And uh, that's the one thing I definitely learned from my first stream, what happened when you don't get, have good lighting. Oh, then the whole stream just turns like snowy and stuff. So generally my home office setup is good. It's, it's good. I'm happy with that. Uh, a Woodley, any experience, knowledge, anecdote with Kali Linux under uh, WSDL, uh, WSL, the Windows, uh, this is the Windows subsystem? The Linux subsystem for Windows. I've heard great things about it. Uh, in fact, uh, let me say that it works really well. Uh, I've had my, I use Windows 10 for, and I'm really happy with it. Um, I was really happy with it. The only thing, and I don't know if this has been changed. I don't know. The biggest issue, and I think the biggest issue with um, the Linux subsystem for Windows is uh, the direct access to the network card and creating packets. So the last time when I was using the Windows, uh, uh, the Linux subsystem on Windows, I had difficulty sniffing packets. I don't know if that's been changed. I don't know if that has been changed with direct access to the networking layer. Uh, Born to be wrong said, for me at least I've had a hell of a time trying to get it set up with WSI and eventually just use a VM with VMware instead. Maybe just because I'm lazy, uh, but it was finicky to get working well in my experience. There are some things I absolutely love with Windows 10. Uh, the new Windows terminal is awesome. I mean, it is really, really good. I mean, Windows have done a job, have done a great job really closing the gap, uh, really closing the gap as the development environment. They've done a really good job with that. Um, I mean, I, I have on, on, a, on a home server, I have uh, Ubuntu installed as a Windows subsystem and it works. The only issue is anytime when you do with like low level packet stuff. That's my only that's my only concern that I have. Nothing on YouTube. Wow. I hope I didn't turn off. Did I? Uh, yeah. There's nothing on YouTube Studio. I, I need some help actually now because it's been a while uh, since you know we've been on. Can someone, if you're watching this right, when you're watching this right now, can someone send a question on uh, the YouTube live stream? See if chat actually works there. We're going to use this time to check if uh, chat actually works on, uh, on YouTube. I don't see any participants or anything. Like someone just sends, uh, send, send something, a test message, a chat message. I, I don't see anything on chat on YouTube studio. Twitch, totally different. So this is really good to test out how things will be um, when we go big time next week. The reason why I am using YouTube, there is a reason why I am streaming out to YouTube as well, is because um, accessibility purposes. YouTube does a good job, pretty good job, um, when you play a video, um, when you, uh, upload a video, it does closed captioning and absolutely necessary when it comes to the online education stuff. 
Uh, is there an easy link to the YT stream? Yeah, let me find it. Hold on, bear with me. Oh, wait a minute. Wait, 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 wait. I don't need that. Hold on. Just, um, ah, here it is. So, Mayette Simpson, here we go. Hello, this is a test. Ah, uh, hello. Let me respond to that. Hello. So, Mayette, you, uh, I guess we should give you an honor a bit. Hello, Ed, how are you? Test, test, hello, hello. Um, I, I guess uh, win the award, you win a gold star, the inaugural chat message on YouTube that I've ever received, if you can believe that. Yeah? So, welcome, welcome. So, hello, Myatt, and hello, Ed. Thank you for joining today. Thank you. Uh, let me see. Ah, here it is. Oh, this is pretty nice. And I can use touch screen on the... Yeah, found it. So, hold on. Can I paste on this? Hey, how do I paste? I'm just pointing at... Copy. Can I paste? Uh, how do I paste when I'm uh, on touch screen? I don't even know. Ah, here it is. Got it. Sent. Yeah. So, anyone, uh, now you know. Yeah, that is the one thing that is now, like, of course, if you are talking about pros and cons of different platforms, um, this is interesting. If you are really, if, you know, one of the things I just we were just learning right now. This is this is really good. Uh, if you are using, if you use Google, and you connect to YouTube, and assuming that you know you use Gmail and stuff, and you use your real name on there when you're on the chat, um, and you're in the chat in YouTube, yeah, it uh, it shows your real name. The username branding stays consistent across. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. Twitch. Of course, yeah, anyone can have a, can have any nickname. Chat delay is about a 10 seconds. 10 seconds, yeah, that's, that sounds about right, Abe Wardley. Yep. Chat delay is about, about 10 seconds. So, if you are concerned about... Ah, so here's the trade-off, I guess, if you're talking about trade-offs. If you are using, uh, if, if you are concerned about, you know, revealing, if you don't want your real name to be revealed, and, of course, you're using uh, Google uh, products, uh, you're using, like, your first name, last name, then um, probably not ideal. Uh, you might want to use Twitch. Yeah. Don't get me wrong, I use, Google all, I use Google all the time. But, again, privacy, you know, for privacy purposes. Lots of pros and cons we're noticing right now. So this is great. This is this is really, really cool. The username says uh, branding. Chat delay is about uh, 10 seconds. Oh, wow. I can just... Oh, something just happened. Oh, I can just scroll up and down the stream. It's only four concurrent viewers on, uh, on YouTube. Twitch is a little bit deeper. All right. Come on. Uh, I'm waiting more questions. Anyway, anyone? Anyone want to ask? Ask away. Uh, you want to talk about things like the graduate program at Tufts, cybersecurity, uh, video games, you name it. Ask away. Ask away. And we'll use this time to go and play. I put two up ago. Wait, you did? 
Which one were they? Sorry. Oh, here it is, here it is, here it is, here it is. I found it. Ha! Huh. Uh, regarding OMS 116, two more questions. Ah, here it is, here it is. The synchronous session will be on Wednesdays. Now, the Thursday, now the Thursday will be additional content available. The answer is yes. So, the OMS, uh, sorry, A. Wardley. Hey, but well, this is good. I mean, so now I got, I'm actually getting into the hang. Yeah, I, this is, I'm getting into the hang of, uh, of looking at the chat screen on, uh, on Twitch. So, um, OMS 116, what is that? So I'm happy to say that this fall will be our inaugural, um, this will be our inaugural uh, class for our, for the Tufts Computer Science Online Masters. Um, let me just say it's been an absolute pleasure working on this. This was something I envisioned, that we envisioned, five years ago. And to finally see it up and running, um, it's just, it's, it's incredible. So, how it works, how the online masters work is, there's a lot of videos that have already been created, but there is going to be a synchronous session on Wednesdays, only one synchronous session, not two, like the on the ground course, that is for like recitation, answering questions and, and that stuff. So um, think of it this way. Think of the online session, the live session on Wednesdays from six to seven fifteen is ask me anything about the week's content. So it's almost gonna act like as, as a recitation. Um, but, um, because I made a decision to, because I made a decision to open up my Thursday class to the world, um, it's just extra benefit for the uh, online master students. So they actually get to tune in on that as well. Uh, uh, and so they're free. I mean, the people in OMS 116, they're also most welcome to not only join in on the Thursday session if they want, if they want, but also to look at that content as well. And the second question is for time budgeting. <laughs> for time budgeting, what do you expect the workload is for this course compared to algorithms? Oh yeah, I... Here's the thing. And I gotta be careful with what I say. <laughs> I gotta be careful with what I say on stream. But one thing I can tell you is I I have control over the workload and the time for um, for the security course. And generally speaking, I tell people I don't envision anyone to be spending more than ten hours of work a week at all on a course. In fact, if you go to the course website on comp116.org, like the time, the expected amount of the workload. The time that you should spend for a lab, it's there. It's there. But generally speaking, I do not expect, I hope and I pray, no one spends more than 10 hours a week. Like even 8 hours is almost a lot uh, on this course. Per, uh, like on the lab and the exercises. And two reasons. One, I'm mindful of people's time. I'm mindful of people's time. Two... In, especially when it comes to cybersecurity, um, so much of the learning, it's can't tell you how critical it is to, you know, look at stuff, read stuff, do to do projects uh, outside the classroom. I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example. Um, my friend, who's a VP at Morgan Stanley. Um, when he interviews people for cybersecurity, for cybersecurity role at Morgan Stanley, the first question he says is, he asks is, tell me about a project or stuff that you've done in cybersecurity outside the classroom. So if I require, like, if I make you spend 20, 30 hours a week of work for this class, there's no way that you're going to do anything cool, right? 
I can't do that. So I, on average, eight to 10 hours. I mean, but then again, it's your choice if you want, it's what you put into it. I mean, if you want to spend 20 hours, if you really, really want to beat the whole capture the flag game on the first lab, hey, be my guest. It's up to you. But in general, I don't want people to be spending more than eight to 10 hours a week on, on, on work. Does that, does that answer your question? I'm really mindful of people's time. And knowing what the field is, like knowing cybersecurity, the, the field, um, just the activities that you do outside the classroom mean a lot. So you have to, but you have, you have, if, if, if cybersecurity is in, is, that's your aspiration, um, you want to take some time and invest your time, invest in yourself and do cool stuff. Um, so that, hopefully, uh, a wordly that answers both of your questions. Let me go to the YouTube. Uh, not, nothing there. Okay, uh, why is Animal Crossing the best game going on right now? Well, a couple of reasons. Um, one, I mean, the premise of the game is chop trees, catch bugs, catch fish, buy stuff, decorate your house. It seems really simple. But the, it's much, much deeper than that. Um, there are also uh, things that you can build beside your own house, such as a museum. And in the museum, you want to catch fish. You want to catch all the fish. You want to catch the insects. Um, and you also have, like, surprises every week. Like yesterday, I got, uh, I got the uh, quote-unquote cousin who sells artwork. And there's also a game where, you know, you can buy artwork. I think it's called Red. He's your cousin. And you can only, you're given four pieces of art, but you can only choose one. But the problem is this cousin guy is a, uh, he's also can be a scam artist. You got to be real careful because he can sell you fake pieces of art. So, for example... A real good example is um, Starry Nights, the actual painting. So you can actually buy that in the game, but you got to be careful. You got to make sure that you're not buying a fake version of uh, of Starry Nights, and then donate it to the museum. I think the other reason why the, the real reason why that Animal Crossing, I feel that it's the best game going on right now. It has some mirror of reality. But it's also extremely social outside of outside of the game as well. Uh, I, I honestly don't know where I would be during this. I mean, I can't couldn't I can't even imagine my pandemic without it. Um, I mean, we I'm in a group where we actually share um, things like clothing, furniture, um, tools, goods. You name it. There's also this really, really interesting uh, thing in the uh, in Animal Crossing called the stock market. So the stock market is on Sundays, there is someone who will sell you turnips between a time of 5 a.m. and 12 p.m. That's it. 5 a.m. and 12 p.m. sharp. Uh, like they're, they're on you, whatever your local time is in the game. You can buy as many turnips as you want. The, the price is going to be random. But during the week, during the week, you can sell those turnips like in a stock market. There are two prices, one in the morning and one in the afternoon. And of course, the premise of the game is, or the premise of the stock market is, you want to buy low and sell high. But during the week, you may, ne I mean, you get prices all over the place. Yeah, you get prices all over the place. Like if you buy buy a turnip at eighty nine, they're called bells. Bells. You don't want to. You want to be selling that for much, much more than eighty nine bells. Yesterday I hit the jackpot. So for the first time in ever, uh, and I got. Um, I'll give you an example. Like yesterday, I uh, I don't know how this happened. One turnip was going for a turnip was going for five hundred and over five hundred bells, so like five thirty, five hundred and thirty eight bells. And so what I ended up doing was I told my girl, I told the group that I'm in, hello, everyone, 
Come to my island now. You can sell your stuff. You can sell your turnips for 500, uh, 500 bill. So people in my group and in our group that were buying, that bought turnips on Sunday morning at 80 to 90 bells and were selling at 500, they were making millions and millions of dollars, I mean bells. And that's the other thing, you can actually have people travel to your island remotely as well too. So it's quite a lot in the game that mirrors a lot of what's in reality. Also, it's, um, it's social and you can also, it's also, you can have many people um, uh, on your island as well. Yeah, I, I've not heard about fall. Uh, okay, have you tested out banning or timing out people on Twitch just in case if anyone is being obtrusive? Uh, not yet. I mean, I don't want to ban you right now. I don't want to do that. Um, that would be interesting. Let's not do that. But I did, one of the things I do have in my chat, um, in in chat, is that I uh, set the moderation to be extreme, like to be really, really strict. Like, so no profanity. Like that stuff, no. Looking to move, okay, so um, looking to move from data engineering to cybersecurity, any, looking to move from data engineering to cybersecurity, any recommendations? Yeah. One thing that comes to my mind, you said about data engineering, um, you can do both. I mean, a big part of cybersecurity is, um, is working with data. So, for example, last month I was working. With, I actually got my hands on both the Proctor U data and uh, the Drizzly hack, and so I shared that with uh, people I work with for auditing purposes. So, for any recommendations, I would say, yeah, you can actually do both. Data engineering and cybersecurity go hand in hand. Um, one of the ideas that well, first of all, for anyone in cybersecurity, you want to have be the real crux is you want to have intellectual curiosity. You want to have a, you want to always ask why, how do things work? Like those are the things. Really, one of the things I really love about security, and it's been over ten years for me. This is one of the few fields in computer science where you really, really have to understand how things work. You actually have to dig the truth. So you want to have that kind of curiosity and have that mindset. But the other thing is, you know, if you want to move from data engineering to cybersecurity, you want to be, there's a lot of data out there. There's a lot of, there's a lot of data sets that you can use for, uh, for security purposes. You can also collect your own. I'll give you an example. So later on in this course, you'll be working with a honeypot. And so I collect a lot of data on a honeypot, like what countries people are from, uh, what are attackers trying to use? What are the weak password people are trying to are using to try to break into my system? Those things. It's really nice to collect all that. And then you can do some real cool stuff with all that information that you collect. Um, so I hope that helps. So for EDE0, uh, EDEO, EDEO 5000, they go hand in hand. Lots of opportunity, but what I would do is find some good data sets or even create your own and try to do stuff with that. You can't learn. I mean, it's so hard in this field to learn and do everything. I mean, one thing I really want to learn is to put all that data into Elasticsearch and Kibana. Yeah, that turnip hustle was, was, yeah. I didn't buy anything. I didn't buy any turnips this week because, um, you know, I kind of made that mistake. <laughs> now looking at what happened yesterday. Yeah, I, uh, oops. Yeah, I usually have to travel to other people's islands and sell my stuff on other people's islands. So I didn't feel like monitoring, like, what was going on. And uh, sure enough. Ooh, so I hit the jackpot yesterday, and I had uh, most, and I, I was, um, I had the most number of turn, I had the highest price, but 
Yeah, I mean, I've sold, I've sold turnips. I've made 1.9 million bells. I think that's the high that I've gone a few times actually, and bought the bought the bought the house, bought everything with it. Um, one of the things I have to say is about animal. With that being said, it's really nice when you actually play Animal Crossing with friends. If you have friends, it really helps. So you can like do like because caring is sharing. Okay, what games are you playing in average? What game are you uh, on average? Sound like Animal Crossing? Anything? Else? Really? Uh, yeah, it's really funny how you had to bring this up. I'm looking at my. I'm gonna look at my Switch right now. Hold on, hold on, hold on. What am I playing right now? I no longer have an Xbox, but I gave that to my buddy Jay, who's now actually streaming with Brian, who's streaming Call of Duty with uh, with Brian, with uh, with the real brick. I, uh, I mean, I got Animal Crossing at the end of May, end of May, so I got the game really late, and I've already spent 220 hours and counting on the game. Um, when Season 21 of Diablo, uh, I was playing that all the time, but I haven't touched that game because I have one conquest left, and I, uh, it's a, it's the one where you had to beat the, uh, uh, uh Nephilim Rift in two minutes, and I still haven't done that. Uh, for season 21 of Diablo, I'm using, um, I'm using the monk. This is the, it was the only character I've never played with. But now looking back at him, it, it was nice, but nothing is, not as good as a barbarian. So my only, the games that I'm playing right now, I'm playing solely Animal Crossing. I'm solely playing Animal Crossing. And there's nothing wrong with that. Literally what I'm solely playing. I got, um, and I got open roller coaster, uh, open art. CT2, Open Roller Coaster Tycoon 2, install my Mac, haven't opened it yet. Any recommendation? Ah, here it is. Um, oh, one thing is, I'm not, oh, one more thing before I forget. Last fall, like, born to, to, to born to be wrong, last fall, Fall. I think you were in that. If I'm not mistaken, you were in that. You took that security, which was stellar. I mean, stellar class. I cannot tell you how much time I wasted on FIFA. I will never do that again. Okay. Any recommendation for recent cybersecurity graduates on job hunting during the pandemic? Yeah, actually, I do. Um. It's still a ripe time. It's still a good time. There are still companies looking for security people. Um, my recommendations. Are you looking for full-time or you're looking for part-time opportunities? Which one? To Wilhelm us. Like, are you looking for full-time or are you looking for part-time? I can tell you, when it comes to cybersecurity, the things that really matters a lot. Um, one, projects. Two, knowing the community, speaking with people. Communications, those things. Um, not so much the coursework. Not so much the education. Uh, here it is. If someone were looking for part-time to get started out, what would you say? You know what? Here's what I would say. If you were looking for part-time to get started out, if you're looking to get started, I would recommend, and I think you're going to find my answer pretty shocking, Probably one of the best places to get started out if you have, if cybersecurity is in your professional roadmap, look into, look into the help desk. Look into the help desk. Look into like the operation, the, the grunt work part of stuff, like uh, an operations center. Here's why. You get to see everything that goes in, you're in the front line, you're in the trenches, you get to see everything. 
So you get to see the ticket. You get to see incidents that happen, right? Oh, something is wrong. You get to see everything. Okay? And once you see everything, you will have an understanding of what the threats are. Every company and institution, big or small, have different threat models. There is, it's not a one size fit all. It's not a one size fit all at all. So you work at, you start at like a place like the help desk and you look at things like tickets uh, and all that. You look at tickets, you look at incidents that come in, you can have a, you have a good understanding of what, your, what the threat profile is. Do you have a, you have a, you have an understanding of what the threat profile is. Um, the other thing is I can tell you off the top of my head and off the cuff, I have to say, like in terms of job search, whether you're doing full-time or part-time when you come to security. And I want to give a shout out to my friend Rob Graham, wherever you are, Rod or Rob. And I remember he and I were talking about this and I was like, cybersecurity is one of those fields that you actually have to work really, really, really hard. You have to work really hard in because things change all the time. It's not everything, like, things change all the time. Things are constant, like it's, it almost feels like a, 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 a never ending battle. But, you know, get a good pulse on what people, what, what incidents are happening. Yeah, keep up with the news. Um, because there are new incidents, including things like malware, malware, ransomware, um, data breaches, they happen all the time. They, they, they happen all the time. So you want to have a good, you want to keep up with that kind of stuff. Uh, keep up with the news on what's happening. Um, I'll, like for example, it didn't seem too long, it wasn't too long ago when we got the news about Proctor, you and Drizzly. And so one of the things I did was, well, see if I can get my hands on the data. So yeah, it's one of those fields where you almost have to keep up, not only keep up with the news, but also keep learning as well. If you're in the job hunt, um, it sounds daunting, but you also want to keep learning as well, too. Maybe learn things like, use things like Shodan. Use the Shodan API to do something. Um, does that help? So it feels like a lot, but it really boils down to, you know, how to get started. Um, start low. Like, don't aim for, you know, don't. Don't aim to, you know, just, 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 don't say, oh, you know what, I, I want to start out being a, a, a secure, uh, you're doing, a, you know, sort of a, a senior security engineer. Now, don't do, don't, you know, that's, that's aspirational, and you should, and you should ask by your job, but look into, you know, what goes really, what will help you get that position. And I can tell you, like, with most, most of the security positions, um, you know, things like help desk building software, understanding how things work, they go a long way. They, they really, really will help you go a long way. Does that answer your question? Off, that's just off the top of my head, and I get this question all the time. But this is one of those fields that you have to work hard, because things change all the time. All the time. Incidents change all the time. The basics, uh, yeah, they change as well, too. But in my security class, I definitely focus on the quintessential basics that they're not going to change in a long time. Does that answer your question? Also, um, also, heads up, since you asked about full-time positions, um, they, if you're actually, if you're interested in full-time position, I mean, after graduation, the recruiting has already began. Earlier today, I received uh, an internship uh, a posting from uh, IBM X Force. So, IBM X Force Summer 2021 Red Team Program, that's already open. Take a look at it. Take a look. If you're at Tufts, um, you know, if you're at Tufts, if you're a student, undergrad, grad, there's Jumbo Sec. The Slack group that we're on, jumbosec.slack.com. So we got stuff going on over there as well. 
Um, also, on that note, on this note about careers, heads up about cybersecurity opportunities. I can tell you right now that the fall is going to be huge. The fall is huge. Um, not only because of the regular college recruiting stuff that's going on. That's, uh, that's, uh, that's, that's still going on. But October is National Cybersecurity Awareness Month. So you will see lots of not only jobs that, that are going to be opening up, but special events. Um, if you're interested in policy, if you're interested in cybersecurity policy, I think Cyber 912 uh, is going to be virtual. Um, we got a mentorship program at the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Hold on for a second. Hold on. Since you're here, one thing I am disappointed in myself that I have not done yet. I have not. Yeah, I hope you're still on. I hope you're still on. I am disappointed in myself that I haven't done this yet. I haven't transitioned over to um, my desktop. Here we go. Hello. I want to show you. I'm going to open up Firefox. Go to masscybercenter.org. I hope that's the right thing. Yay! Mass Cyber Center. Uh, Massachusetts Cyber Center. If you're in Massachusetts and you're a student or a professional, we are launching a Massachusetts Cybersecurity Mentorship Pilot Program. Yeah. And so if you're a college student, in Massachusetts, you can join. The um, sign-up, yep, must be an undergrad enrolled. Uh, must have an academic experience. The student application, mentor application. Um, that's going to close near the end of September. So you got some time. I want to bring that to your attention. Well, which is good in this in this case um, here because now I actually can trans. I can actually show you uh, my desktop, so I don't have to just stay on one screen all the time. Um, I don't have the IBM X Force opportunity. I mean, I get so much stuff every state. They, they're starting to trickle in. The opportunities are starting to trickle in. But if you're an undergraduate uh, student, you can sign up to be a mentee. Um, also, just a uh, heads up, I am actually ineligible to be a mentor because I'm on the steering committee. Uh, so I'm on the steering committee here. Anyone on? No one on YouTube. No questions on YouTube. Anyone else? Any other questions? Damn, I should have tried, I should have, I should have, you know, I'm glad that you brought up this career question, because now I can flip to, uh, to my desktop, and show that, and it looks pretty good, and here I am on the lower left hand, lower left corner, um, it's 546 right now, uh, any other questions, thoughts, anyone else, I think this went well, you think the qual what do you think of the quality? of the audio, the video, the lighting, what are your thoughts? Come on, anyone? Chime in. Anyone? I'm gonna transition back to myself. There we go, cool. Yeah, you like this format, you like this format. What are your thoughts? Yeah, yeah, cool. One thing is that I wish I can do, um, and I tell Brian this all the time, is uh, go hardwire. 
but I'm actually on wireless right now. I mean, if I had to do wired, I mean, I have to get like a two, I'm, I'm not sure if I want to buy 200 feet ethernet cable. I don't know if I want to do that. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, if, if there's anything for today, I, uh, yeah, this was impromptu. This is just a, uh, this is just a dry run for next week. Uh, if there's anything that I know, if there's anything that I've learned from this, and quite a few things, I mean, like the differences, the pros and cons of YouTube Studio and, and Twitch. Um, the other thing is, is that I definitely need some water. I definitely need some water. All right. But at any rate, um, you know, it's, uh, it's 547 now. Uh, if you want to, you know, I'm always accessible by way of email. That's my email address at the bottom of, uh, of the scene at mchow at cs.toughstar.edu. And, yeah, well, I'm going to sign off. I'm going to sign off, and we'll see you next week. See you next Thursday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern Time.